clothing that would that they would make with it. I remember last year camp, um, Dave and Miriam had their Bible camp T-shirt quilt, and that was that was great. And that that was I love I just love to see those patterns. And that's what we're going to talk about today: is maintaining the pattern, or do we need a new hermeneutic? And I, the word hermeneutic means the science of biblical interpretation. If you want to simplify that, you could say maintain the pattern, or do we need a, another way to interpret Scripture? There are some of, some in our world that want to change the pattern that is in Scripture. In fact, some say that we don't have a pattern at all; that we can just do whatever we want and then still be pleasing in God and in, in, in the sight of God. We know that's not the case because the Bible speaks of a pattern in many different places. The word pattern simply is a form to be followed. It's by its very nature detailed and specific. Such as the case when you go to build a building and you have a blueprint. Here's how this building is made. Or if you go build some, if you're familiar with building certain things for for your kids that, that have these little toys or something that needs to be built, you follow the instructions. Unless, of course, sometimes people don't want to follow the instructions and then they wonder why did they go wrong. And it's because we don't follow the instructions. I remember trying to put something together and I said, I don't need the instructions. I tossed it aside. I can do this on my own. And it turned out to be, a, to be a disaster because I did not follow the instructions. God has given us an instruction book to follow and that's the Word of God. That is the Word of God. The Word of God governs the way we do things as far as our worship the way we do things as far as our, our obedience to God and how we are pleasing in His sight. But today there are those that argue and that want to say that we need to have a different pattern. That the old pattern is, 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 is too old school. We are, we've been doing things uh, too wrong and we need to abandon that and come with a new hermeneutic, a new way to interpret Scripture. And you see, the, the thought of that is, is by adding things that God has not authorized and no wonder why you want, wonder why they come to that conclusion. Because if you abandon the pattern that God has set, then anything goes, anything is allowed. So is the, is the way is the way God has it set in His Word? Is that enough, or do we need to go something further? And if you have the handout, you might find number letter B where it says discuss John Mark Hicks's book Searching for the Pattern. This this is a book that. It was brought to my attention by some because some have been promoting this book as if it's the next thing since sliced bread. And the problem with the book is, as I read through it, is he, had, he, 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 he is a former uh, a, a professor from David Lipscomb University, and which is supposed to be a, quote, brotherhood school, but it's not. It's gone to the left. And he promoted this, he, he wrote this book in which he suggests that the, the, the way we authorize, the way we do the Bible needs to change. It needs to be different. We need to abandon command, example, and necessary inference. And we need to focus on a more, quote, theological pattern. I don't have the whole about the book in the, in the, in the outline, but I'm not going to sit here and have a reading session, by the way. I just wanted to read this, this little insert that has on the back of this book that gives you all you need to know. It says, in this book, John Mark Hicks tells the story of his own hermeneutical journey in reading the Bible. Lovingly and graciously, he describes his transition from a, quote, blueprint hermeneutic to a more theological one. Some suggest that moving away from a patternistic command example and necessary inference approach for understanding what God requires leaves no other alternative, or at least none that both respects biblical authority and seeks to obey the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. In searching for the pattern, John Mark offers such an alternative. In other words, he goes throughout this Bible in which he, ha he, he, he judges based upon his experience of how we should do things. And, it, and it, he goes throughout the book talking about how he discussed with a non-institutional brother and all this stuff and they needed to go, to do, go against uh, the Bible. And it comes down to it, the guy, the, he, he abandons the Bible. He abandons the pattern set forth in Scripture. So but I'm thankful, and I hope you're thankful to God, that God gives us patterns that instruct us in what He commands. God didn't leave us in the dark and have us to figure out, well, what does God want from us? God has told us what He wants. There has always been a pattern in Scripture from the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
How could we ever know how to please the Lord if the Lord did not tell us at all? What kind of God would it be if God expected obedience but did not tell us how to obey? Folks, that wouldn't be a good God at all. That, would be, that wouldn't be God at all. The Lord Jesus always does what is pleasing to the Father, John 8, 28 and 29. He always sought to do that which pleased the Father. And to show His love for the Father, Jesus does exactly what the Father commands, John 14, 31. Jesus told His disciples that if you love Me, you will keep My commandments. Well, what's the opposite of that? If we don't keep God's, His commandments, what, what does that mean? We don't love God. That's plain. So what? So the Bible does have commands to be obeyed. We need to, quote, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. Colossians 1, 9 through 10. Well, how do we do that? By following the pattern that God has set forth in Scripture. Number one, let's look at some patterns found in the Old Testament. Number one, God gave Noah a pattern for building the ark of gopher wood, Genesis 6, 14-16. Not too long ago, we discussed about Noah and the ark. And God told Noah how to build the ark. Did, God, did Noah have the liberty to just build the ark any way he wanted to because he thought it would be better? Absolutely not. God said, here's how I want you to make it. Is there, any, is there a builder better than God? Can any man build better than what God builds? Even Paul had said, 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 and you can put an exclamation point with it, 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. God, is, God knows how to build things. God is the God of all wisdom. Seek the one that has all wisdom, that tells us, that gives us a pattern. And Noah, according to the Bible, did everything that God commanded by the way he specified. God specified, I want you to make an ark out of gopher wood. But now God didn't say, you shall not use pine wood. You shall not use oak wood. God doesn't have to list everything He couldn't use. When God tells something to be built, that's what He wants. Just do what He says. Trust God. And God, didn't, God never asked Noah, I want you to understand why I'm asking for these things. Just trust God and do it. Because God says it. God has never led man astray. God has never led man the wrong way. He's always led man on the, road, on the road to righteousness and how to have eternal life. God is good. God would never tell us something that we couldn't do. Noah had a pattern for the animals to come into the ark. Genesis 7, 2 and 3. They came in two by two. My wife Noah said, well, that's not good enough. We need, we, we need to expedite this. We need to have all of them come at once. Of course, that wouldn't make any sense, would it? Do it the way God did. God said it. Don't you, here's what I want you to do. Do it. I don't see why in our, in, in our world we have a problem with, with doing what God says. When God says, it's like a parent to a child. When a parent tells a child, I want you to do this, and the child says, but, but, I, because I said so. I want you, the parent expects the child to do what is being told. And that, that helps to mold the child and what he should be. That's how God treats you. That's how God disciplines man. We look at that in Hebrews chapter 12 about the discipline of the Lord. Who God loves, he disciplines. If God, and God loved, if God didn't love us, he wouldn't have given us a pattern. He wouldn't have told us what he wanted. Why does he tell us what he wants? Because he loves us. He wants us to do well. He wants us to succeed. He has given us everything. That we forgot life in God in 2 Peter 1 3. The Word of God is inspired, it is it's able to equip us, 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17. It is God's Word. One of the problems is, I think, that people have is they have a, have a hard time trusting what the Bible says. We need to trust what the Bible says and do it because it says so. We don't have to, God never asked us to understand why. He just said, do it. He said, trust me and do it. Because God is right. Genesis 6, 22. Thus Noah did according to, note this word. You may circle this in your Bible. Genesis 6, 22. According to all that God had commanded him, so he did. You don't read anywhere in Genesis 6 and 7 of Noah asking God why. 
Why do I need to build this out of, out of gopher wood? Why can't I build it out of this? He just did it. Because God said it. That's faith. That's trust. That's conviction. And the God who made this world, God said it, therefore I'm going to do it. God called Noah an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Hebrews 11, 7. Why was he in faith's hall of fame? Because he did all according to what God said. He was righteous. He did what was right. And that was by faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. God gave Moses. Not only Noah, but Moses an explicit pattern for building the tabernacle. Exodus 25, 9. Let's go to Exodus 25 and verse 9. Next 25, God is giving instructions as for the contribution and, and the things of the tabernacle. In verse 8, he says, And let them make a sanctuary or a temple for, for me, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I'm going to show you as to what pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall make it. Verse 40 and see that you make them after the, here's our word again, pattern for them which was shown to you on the mountain. Then you move over to, to chapter 26 and verse 30. Again about the pattern. Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to its plan or pattern which you have been shown on the mountain. God gives three chapters of details how to build the tabernacle. That's from Exodus chapter 25 to 27. Here we, have, here we have again in the Old Testament a pattern of how to build a tabernacle. God gave a pattern. Again, just like He did with, with, with Noah. He gives what He wants. God gives detailed instructions on the priesthood and the offerings of the tabernacle in these same three chapters. The Israelites did as Moses, Moses commanded, Exodus 39, 32, and Moses examined the work and blessed the people. Go, go with me to Exodus 39, 42 and 43. Thirty nine, forty two, and forty three. Thus, according to all that Yahweh commanded Moses, so the sons of Israel did in all their service. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it just as Yahweh had commanded. So they had done. Then Moses blessed them. When was the people blessed? After they followed the pattern. Was there a pattern in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Was there a pattern with Noah? Yes. Was there a pattern with Moses? Yes. God regarded Moses as faithful in all his house, Hebrews 3, 2. Why? Because he followed the pattern. He did as God said. I hope you're following the pattern of the, of the message of this, of this lesson. We'll be just as blessed if we follow the pattern that God has given us in the New Testament. God gave, not as new to Joshua, God gave Joshua a detailed pattern for conquering Jericho. Did not God say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to march around the city uh, once for this many days. And on, on the, that last day, he said, march around seven times. And then the child and blow the trumpet. What if they decided, well, we don't need to march seven times on that last day. We'll just march one. God's going to give it to us anyway. And there's no need to do all seven. Folks, if, if, if Joshua and the people had done that, God would not have given them care of but they did as God said. They marched around the city, they blew the trumpets, did as God said, said, said they needed to do. And what happened? As the song says, the walls came tumbling down. Did not God keep his word when he said, What to do? Yes. Or did they, what did they have to do in order, in, order, in order to please God? Follow the pattern. Did you get the pattern? Pattern of obedience, of doing what God says. God has always required obedience, both Old and New Testament. There is a pattern. I don't know of any New Testament pattern as complicated as the instructions for walking around the walls of Jericho, yet Joshua was faithful. Could you imagine being one of the people that's listening to Joshua? Joshua comes and says, okay, here's what, here's what the Lord says. We're going to march around the city. We're going to Can you imagine? We're going to what? That's not how you conquer a city. March around it, and then the, and then, and then the walls are going to fall down, and we just march and shout. But by faith, they did. And what happened? The walls fell. Who caused the walls to fall? 
Because they follow him. But hey, by faith, Hebrews 11.30, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. The blessing only comes after obedience, not before. It's been, it's been that case in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a pattern to follow in the old and new. When, when the people failed to fulfill the patterns God gave, God punished them. One of the cases in point is Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. What happened to Nadab and Abihu whenever they de departed from the pattern? Let's look at it. Leviticus 10. Don't just take my word for it, take God's word for it. Because it's God's word that matters. My opinion means nothing. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans or censer and put fire in them. Then they placed incense on it and offered, notice this, strange fire before Yahweh which he had not commanded them. Well, God didn't say not to. What did they do? They did what God had not commanded. And what happened? Verse 2, And fire came from the presence of Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. The result of abandoning the pattern was death. What's the result if we abandon the pattern of Scripture? Eternal death. Eternal destruction. That's seen in both the Old and the New. Verse 3, Now notice this, then Moses said to Aaron, It is what Yahweh spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. And before all the people, I will be glorified. So Aaron kept silent. These are his sons who have just been killed by the Lord for offering strange fire. Could you imagine it being your son? And you just saw this. And the Bible says, And Aaron kept silent. That would be hard to do. And they're also told not to mourn. Later on in this same, same verse, it says, Then Moses called to Mishael, and he called Luther, people, come, come near and carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary to outside of the camp. So they came near and carried them still in their tunics to the outside of the camp, as Moses has said, and Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not uncover your heads, nor, nor tear your clothes, so that you will not die, and that he will not become wrathful against all the congregation. But your relatives of the whole house of Israel shall weep over the burning which Yahweh has brought about. You shall not even go out from the door, uh, doorway of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of Yahweh is upon you. So they did to the, according to the word of Moses. Again, you have this pattern. And you have instructions later on about this. But God gave a pattern. And what happens when you depart from the pattern? Death. Death. What happens to, what happens to man today with, with God's pattern? I don't like it. It doesn't suit me. I want to change it. Because I don't feel. And that's a problem. We have too many eyes in that. By people that say that. I don't like the way God has it. I don't like the, how, how our worship, our, our acapella, our, our, our singing only without the use of mechanical instrument. It's just, it's just old school. It's not going to bring anybody. It's just, we, got, we need to come in and get with the times. You know, bogeys, that's what they say. I'm going to stand on what God stands, and I would rather stand with God than be against Him. Because if I'm against God, the only thing that comes to me is death. I want to be with him on the last day, and that means doing it exactly what he says. By how he said it. The problem with adding to God's worship is it takes God out of the object of the worship and it, took, and it places it on man. How often in cases where congregations or churches have added those things that God has said not to, and the response is, oh, did you hear how beautiful that music is? Didn't that person play that guitar very well? So you see the problem? Now we're turning into entertainment, praising the person and not praising God. God says, sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. He did not say sing and play. He said sing. Ephesians 5.19. That's what God said. 
God didn't say, I want you to do it. Here's what I don't want you to do. Because he specified what he wanted. Same way with the Lord's Supper. Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. That eliminates anything else. We have a pattern. We have a pattern for worship and how we are to govern our lives and how we are to obey God. It, it's, it's sickening to, to see people advocate to depart from the pattern when people died when that happened. And yet we have people in our world lead that up. What about Uzzah? Uzzah perished when he touched the ark because they did not carry, they did not carry it according to the instruction. Now remember how they carried that that ark? They carried it on a cart. But what had God said to do with the, with that with the ark of the covenant? Carry it by the poles. The Israelites carried it by the poles, not on a cart. And so when that that, that ark started wobbling, Uzzah touched it and he died. If they had done important what God had said, that would not have happened. That would not have happened. Departure always equals death. But it's not just the Old Testament. There's patterns in the New Testament. Obedience to the Gospel. We just read in Romans 6 about how they, the Romans, and including us, the Roman brethren, had obeyed from the heart that form of, or that pattern of teaching to which you were given over. Is there a pattern for us to follow? Paul says yes. Anyone that tells you, you, can, you don't have to follow the pattern set forth in Scripture is a liar. Because God says there is a pattern. There is a way to obey God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one will get to heaven without doing what Jesus says. None. Jesus even said himself in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who what? Does the will of my Father in heaven will enter. The scriptures are clear. We have to obey God. There is a pattern of obedience. There's a pattern of how we do things. Jesus set a pattern in His death, burial, and resurrection to which Paul said, I would remind you of, of first importance in 1 Corinthians 15. How Jesus died according to the Scriptures. How He was buried according to the Scriptures. And He was raised on the third day. And it goes on to describe how He was seen by 500 brethren at one time by them and Apostle Paul. Jesus died, He was buried, He was raised. What do we do whenever we obey the gospel? We die to sin, we are buried with Christ, and we rise to walk in newness of life. The pattern which Jesus gave. There's nothing wrong with our pattern. Baptism fulfills the pattern of crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. Romans 6, 3-7. Know you not that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus, baptized into His death, you cannot and will not enter heaven without being born again. The Bible is so clear. Matter of fact, one of, one of our elders, one of the elders at Arlington Congregation, he spoke at the uh, youth rally. He, he, he was talking about in John 3 where it says you must be born again. And he mentioned the fact how some people say there's no water in John chapter 3, verse 16. He said, oh, oh, oh yeah, but the whole chapter is soaking wet and it's so much that if I had the strength I could, I could ring my Bible and water would just come pouring out. Of course, he's using that as an illustration, but he says there's water all over the place. You cannot avoid water and get into heaven. Because God said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. That does not mean because of. It means in order to receive the remission of sins. What is wrong with doing what God said? What's so hard about it? It's as as the, what's the it, it is what Sherlock Holmes said. It's elementary, my dear Watson. It is elementary. It is. It shouldn't be that hard to understand. Do what God says, you'll be blessed. Don't do what God says. What's the result? The wages of sin is death. But the good news is, you don't have to die eternally. The free gift of God is, 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 is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you follow the pattern, trust me. Don't just trust me. Trust God. 
who said it. Be faithful unto death and you will receive what? The crown of life. Do we trust God? That, the God that said it? There was a question and answer for him over several different issues. And one of the most common things that was said, or he, he, would, he would say in a lot of these different questions, he'd say, he'd say, a lot of the times is, the scripture doesn't need much explanation as much as it needs believing. Do we believe what God said? If we believe, we'll do it. There's nothing wrong with doing it. Because there's a blessing come from doing God's Word. Number next, the Lord's Supper is a pattern. Matthew 26 to 29. It is both to be received and delivered. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. In which Paul said, For which I was received from the Lord, and that night in which He was betrayed to the bread, He gave us the pattern of how to do the Lord's Supper. The bread and the fruit of the vine. And how, remember in the context of 1 Corinthians 11, the Corinthians had turned that into, into much more. They, they had abandoned the pattern. They were, they were making a common meal. Not only that, they were not willing to share with, with, with those that were without. They had abandoned the purpose of the Lord's Supper. And which Paul had to bring them back and say, this is to remember Christ. This is not a game. If you want to use a paraphrase here. This, what we do for Christ is not a game. It's for a purpose. There's a reason why God says do stuff. He doesn't give us something to do just because He wants to with a kneeling. It's because there's a purpose of why He said do it. He created us. He knows our heart. He knows how we think. He knows how we feel. He knows all about us. And He knows how it's easy for man to forget. Why do we do this on the first day of the week according to the biblical pattern? Because man is easy to forget. But how often have I heard it from, from folks who claim to be Christians? We, uh, we need to uh, think about not doing it every week because it's become old and, and, and it's just boring because we've done it over and over and over. Have you missed the big picture of why he did it? Because Christ said to. Because it reminds us of the greatest sacrifice that will ever be made in our lifetime. In man's lifetime. And that is Jesus Christ who gave His body and His blood for us so that we have salvation. That's what this is for. If you have trouble during the Lord's Supper, go back to the cross. Think about Him leading there. And how He loved you to give His life for you while you were still a sinner. While you were still a sinner. Romans 5.8 and think about that sacrifice and how much it means to you that without it, man has no hope. And use that time to be thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life. And it should be remembered every, every week. That doesn't mean that every day you can't remember Jesus. But this is a specific avenue of remembering, remembering Him. The Lord's Supper. Our giving was on the first day of the week from a form of pattern, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. On every, first, on every first day of the week, every first of the week, lay by his door as he may prosper. And if no gathering's not come, and matter of fact, there, someone asked, well, how, what's the percentage of how much I should give in the New Testament? There is none. What about a time? There is no time. That's on the yoke of As you have prospered. Second Corinthians 8 and 9. First give yourselves to the Lord, then to us, as I said, uh, for God loves, and it says later on, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Don't be like the person that sits there holding the money over the place like, mm, I don't want it. okay, that's not a cheerful giver. Love to give. Love to give. Love to give. Think about the widow who gave all that she had. It's not necessarily the amount that you give, but the heart and the attitude in which you give. And that helps you. Because God gave. God gave Jesus a gift that we can't repay. There is nothing that we can offer that could ever repay that gift. But what we do give, God appreciates. And you will be blessed. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. And then the qualification for elders and deacons form a pattern. First Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3.1-13. through 13. 
I don't have time to go through all that. Jesus left us an example for us to follow in His steps. 1 Peter 2, 21-23. He gave us a pattern of how to handle suffering. How to handle suffering when He was reviled, He did not know it. Reviled back again. He gave His life. He gave us a pattern of how to handle, handle adversity. How to handle persecution. How to handle through life. Follow the pattern. How did Christ handle His adversaries? He opened not His mouth. He opened it when he needed to, when the response was warranted. He didn't revile in the same way they did. He didn't say, well, he didn't call them names and say, well, you, and, 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 and get up uh, angry and all that same. He opened not his mouth. They charged him with blasphemy, which was a false charge. They ran him through a kangaroo court. He could have opened his mouth and said, this is not right. But he did not. Because he saw the great purpose. And that's you and me. Love. He could have called 10,000 angels, but what, for what, what caused him to keep, keep going and serve us as a pattern? Love. What should cause us to obey God? One word. Love. Love is our motivation. Love is our motivation to do anything for God. It should never be our feeling, well, we should obey God oh, because I have to. Because I get to. We were told in preaching school, brethren, you earn the pulpit. And you should feel every time I get to preach. I have the privilege of preaching. I have the privilege of serving God no matter what capacity it is. Because it's by God's grace that we are able to serve Him. Without Christ, we can do nothing. Uh, we are just servants. We are servants of the great reward by doing what it says. Eternal life is worth all that we have to go through. Paul admonished the church at Rome, Romans 12, 2, we are not to be conformed to the world, but transformed so that we may prove what the will of God is. Romans 12, 2. We're to be the living sacrifice, not conformed to the world. And we are to have the mind of Christ. Christ did not count the position he had as robbery. He didn't say, I'm going to remain here and not go. He took on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He took on flesh. Brethren, that is selfless. That's not selfish. There, there's, no, there's no greater selfless person than Christ. God did. Christ came and took upon this, this, this flesh and He lived perfectly and yet He still died. A gruesome and harsh, horrible death. But He didn't remain dead. He came up three days later because of who He is. Because that was the term, the term land that God had. You and I, without His shed blood, we have no forgiveness. He has provided us salvation. He is our example. He is our example of pattern and follow. And all of His words are included from, from, from Matthew all the way to Revelation because even when He spoke to disciples, what the Spirit would give them is not from Himself, it's from what Jesus said. And Jesus got from the Father. From, from Matthew, from Genesis to Revelation, all of it is inspired. All of it is inspired. Because some people say, I've heard, and we'll come to the completed here in a moment. I've heard some say, we should only be focused on the red letters. Because that's the word of Jesus. John chapter 14 through 16 explains that anything following the red letters are also the words of Jesus. Because what were the apostles to write? That which the Holy Spirit had in Brian. Where did the Holy Spirit get it from? Jesus. Because Jesus said he will not speak of his own authority, but what he shall hear, that's what he'll speak. Everything in the New Testament is the word of Jesus. And they need to be obeyed. Because a failure to obey Jesus, a failure to obey what God said in the entire New Testament, will lead to death. Not everyone will say the will of the Lord. But he who does the will of the Father 
And in that day, there will be many that's going to say, did we not do all these different things in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And, and you can think of much more things people could say. But then people will say, that apart from me, I never knew you. I didn't know you are. You could work at me. Because they failed to do according to the pattern. Should we maintain the pattern or do we need a new pattern? Do we need a new way of interpreting Scripture? No. Because God's way works. And it's proven time and time again from Genesis to Revelation. So don't listen to anybody that says we need to leave the pattern. Because that's not the pattern. God's word is from God. We need to believe it and do it just as He says. It should not surprise us that the Lord wants us to live by patterns. That's logical. The Lord does what He sees the Father doing, John 5, 19. The Lord's way is a way of obedience. And the Lord abides in, abides in those who love Him enough to obey His word. Christ will not dwell with those that refuse to obey Him. But He will love and continue to love. He loves everybody. If we love Him, we'll do what He says. It's that simple. It's that plain. It's as plain as 2 plus 2 is 4. Just do what it says. Why is 2 plus 2 equals 4? Because it's true. Believe it. Why do we do what we do? Because God says it. And it should, it, it should cause us joy to do what God says. And when people say, and when people make old statements about us, uh, about how, how we obey God, let it be like waters off a duck's back because where will you be standing on the last day? We are faithful. Because you did what was right. Despite what others may say. Keep your head up. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep living for God. Be steadfast. Unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain. It's not useless in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If we're working for the Lord and we're following the pattern, if God be for us, who can be against us? And that question is rhetorical in Romans 8, 31. Their answer is no one. No one. Not even Satan. No one. If God's for us, no one is against us. Let us continue to follow the pattern. The pattern set forth in Scripture. You may have a need to respond to the invitation this morning. Please come now as we stand and sing.